This podcast contains adult language, descriptions of violence, sexual references, and other possibly offensive themes. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome to this episode of Back to the Story, where friends come together to play Dungeons and Dragons. I'll be your DM, Klaus. Let's get started. How do three paladins of separate gods... But if you ask me what my calling would be, I'd say that of a defender of my friends. I would give my life to see them through. I could have, but I didn't. And every day has been beautiful since. I think I'm surrounded by good things. A cleric on a hunt for redemption. I need it for my friends, family, these people that I love, who have always been the answers to my prayers. Whatever the hell you are. I don't know if deserving has anything to do with anything. A storyteller. And if you ever need me ever again, let me know. And one that I haven't figured out yet. I think that would take me a while to find someone more knowledgeable than me. All come together. And there's not a bit of fate in that. I think you mispronounced friends. Well, I will drink to that. When you see God's rest surrounded by armies, then know that his desolation has come near. Take these wings to Nymanet. Carry them home. <laughs> Episode 49, Promise Fulfilled. Gilded light shines upon the backs of soldiers, thrashing shield upon shield, spear into flesh, blood splattering upon the stone. The light streams from two suns set in the golden eyes of a man. Tan skin and a dark mane of wild hair fly over the battlefield, which shakes and trembles as the blood of a god falls like rain, wailing crimson lightning. The man flies straight up, towards the sky, towards the cracking heavens as the vision pans back, offering a view of armies clashing below like two seas meeting. Mortals and Celestials alike dance and battle in the sky, as the God-King ascends towards the God of Light, wounded, clutching their side which streams liquid brilliance. A spear of sunlight thrusts downward as a silver saber rises to meet it, a blinding flash of light. Remembrance of the ascended God-King, Galvedon Ralakia. Previously, as the Bronze Scales defeated the Assassin and Eliza Underwater, they recovered what they could find in their makeshift encampment before heading back towards the surface world. Passing back up the twelve-hour lift and through the mines, they came upon the lake where a serpentine creature attempted to drag Ellery and then Ezekiel underwater. Outmaneuvering whatever awaited below the surface, the scales continued up into the ceiling and through the halls until they came to the room where the sentient kelp resided. Assaulting the aberration, Ezekiel shaped the stone doorway open as the conflict began. The kelp fought back with tentacles and blasts of overwhelming memories, leaving many scales stunned as you began to wear it down. Vesper was called inside the creature when it was finally defeated, Ball pulling its corpse up out of the well as Ezekiel swam down to find a strange, violet glass creature of some sort attached to the plant. We come back to the story here. After you all have caught your breath just outside the well and ascended the stairs, Ball recollecting his tossed caltrops. You now stand at the top of that spiral staircase, having re-entered the viaduct and sewer complex beneath Nymanet. The scent of mold and wet animal hangs in the air with echoing sounds of running and dripping water. What would you like to do? So, last time we were up here, I believe there were a couple of interesting folks just around the corner. Do we want to investigate to see if they're still there? I'd be curious, certainly. They don't have anything to do with the will, apparently, so I kind of want to know why they are down here. If we can avoid getting to a fight, that would be nice. Well, um, I had an idea about that, actually. I mean, they're a bit afraid of Ezekiel's serpent form. Yeah. And it has kind of that hood-looking thing, right? Yeah, and I added. Yeah, well... Uh, you know, the veil I, I wear when I activate it, it gives me kind of a hood. And my sword is, like, covered in snakes. And I do have a spell that can make my eyes look like 
snake like. Maybe if I don't say anything and have somebody else talk for me, we can like work out. I'm not good at bullshitting people, but you guys are. Maybe we can work something out to like frighten them into talking. This sounds like a wonderfully complicated solution to what probably be a simple problem, but I am so ready to do it. What kind of snake do you want me to be? Uh, probably your giant one, I guess, or something big. Would you like to ride me? You know, no, I think we're good just standing side by side. Ah, uh, you sure? Pretty positive. As you wish. Okay. So do you, you guys continue back through um, the way you came through the tunnels, which are, again, shaped in that circular or cylindrical form. You pass through a few rooms where there is creeks of water running uh, through them. Yep. Have we already passed where the insectoid creatures were? Uh, you have. That was behind okay. you. Okay, just making sure. As you pass through that area, there weren't any in in where they were chasing you. They seemed to have retreated back into that ravine where they were. Yeah, you guys pass through those few rooms as you come to where you can start to see the signs that you remember last time. Where it looks like there's that room ahead to the right in this long hallway. So I'll make sure the hood is activated. I'll draw my rapier, which has the the snakes in the handle, and I will use thaumaturgy. I'll speak some primordial word to kind of that sounds sort of hissing and uh, make my eyes look like snakes eyes. And I'll turn into a big old snake. Okay. I presume you're trying to get their attention with a loud primordial scary voice? Sure, yeah. Okay. Give me an intimidation check. Not good at that. <clears throat> so after my modifier, that's a, that's a one. You start to say the words. <laughs> Sun gets caught in your throat and you cough up a little bit. You eventually get it out. Like, <clears throat> mm, hey, boss. Mm. And you see the flickering candlelight as a curtain is kind of pulled back. And you see a humanoid figure kind of shift their head out to look down the tunnel. Boss, it's back. And you see the curtain quickly close and footsteps as it runs off. What do you mean it's back? Turp, you idiot. What's back? Uh, the, 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 the worm. And you just hear them arguing over who knows what. Um, Presumably here. So I step up next to Vesper, kind of like one step behind her, and I call out, The Mistress of Snakes demands your attention. You hear that, boss? That the, the Mister of Snakes is, uh, attention. Yeah, I, I heard. Why don't you? Why don't you get out there, Turp, and and see what they want? Hey, I don't, I mean, you see, eventually the curtain pushed to the side as a few individuals are pushing that bigger one out. He's maybe six five, pretty broad shouldered, definitely a big beer belly. As this large human is pushed out, and the curtain is swiftly drawn back. Um, hello, Mister Snake. He's wearing a big straw like hat, like a farmer's hat. And he's holding a torch in one hand, like shaking towards the hallway. That's too dark for him to see down. I will draw myself up to my full height and kind of glance at Ellery. Mm. Come forward peacefully and there will be no need for trouble. Uh, I don't, I don't, do I have to? Do you want food? Make an intimidation check. Uh, I don't care which. Uh, that's a 22. <gasps> he like drops and fumbles his torch and like picks it back up. And, like is slowly torch in both hands, like shuffling forward. He comes like forward like 10 feet and then stops. Uh, is this good, Mr. Snake? We should really be talking to the boss, Ricky. He's, you know, he's the one that knows about things. Then by all means, call him out here. Okay, and he likes quickly just any excuse and runs back through, drops the torch onto the uh, hallway, runs back through, crashing through, tearing the curtain, running back in. You hear a clatter of things falling on the stone ground. 
Sarp, what the? I'm not going out there. Sarp, get out, get back. No, you. Uh. And then there's a uh, a form that's thrown out of the room, hits the other end of the hallway. As you see, a form kind of slide down. Standing up, looking around, you see a dwarf that's like balding on the top, but the sides are just wild and long. Um, you see he has very thick mutton chops. And as he's looking around, you see actually um, uh, this dwarven individual kind of getting up, brushing himself off. What so? Oh, shit. Uh, you know, we we come in peace. Don't want any trouble. You know, just come right by. No problem here. As this dwarf kind of stands up, but is like shifting towards the room. I'll recast thaumaturgy with the same kind of hissy word. Keep it going. Uh, I don't know, snake lady, but, you know, feel free to, you know, whatever you need. Sure. You know, you want a beer or like, you know, just want to leave. Silence. Great too. Oh. Silence. Shit. All right. Well, my mistress is curious. She wants to know what brings you to these tunnels? I mean, you know, what do you think brings a dwarf like this to a tunnel you know you're just getting out of the city you know vacationing over here you know having a good time i mean it's bad in there i wouldn't you know if you're looking for stuff there's nothing in there that you should worry about um i kind of hiss some fake snake primordial at vesper <laughs> make I'm a deception not. check <laughs> Okay. This is classic D and D shenanigans. I love it. That's World's a ending, but dirty twenty. You see him like looking over, worried, like eyes darting back and forth between y'all two and then the room. He's kind of shifting towards it. I'll like stick the rapier in the ground. <clears throat> uh, all right, you know. So, uh, you know, feel free to to just leave or like whatever you want, you know. Just down here trying to live, you know? I kind of tilt my head at Vesper like I'm waiting for her input. Um. You like mm. rat? I cook up a mean rat. Stew, steaks, you know, stuff like that. So I'll <laughs> lean down and like whisper to Ellery and go, Are they telling the truth though? Why do they need a boss if they're just a group of people squatting here? Um, I look at them and say, this is an odd place for vacation. What really brings you down here? Hey, you know, they, they don't like us up there, so we're just trying to get away from, you know, everybody, giant snakes, you know, all that shit that, you know, bothers a man just trying to live. Hmm. And... Who is it that doesn't like you? If you're going to be drawing enemies down into these tunnels, my mistress needs uh, to know. You know, no one really just, uh, you know, came here for the scenery, you know, having a good smoke without anybody messing with you. You know, how, you know, it was the same reason you're here, probably, probably snakes, probably smoke stuff or whatever. I take a step towards him. That's, you know, that's fine. And he's now like, his body's in the room, but his head is going to lean out. And I, I kind of work my head and let my fingers start to smoke. Oh, shit. Hey, you're right. They, they do smoke something. And the taller individual kind of leans out. Don't feed Harold to them, though. He's my favorite. Terp, I swear. I swear to all the gods. Uh, so I'm going to just uh, let you, you know, do your thing. Nice to meet you, Snake Lady and the other person and Mr. Snake. And he like, just slowly like shifts into the room. I am going to say one more line in fake snake language. And then just kind of nod towards the path forward, because I don't think this is getting us anywhere. I will take a second and just try and not laugh loudly, <laughs> but get all the giggles out, and then 
yeah, that that seemed like a bust. I'm sure they're perfectly fine. Let's just go. <laughs> Thanks, Ezekiel. I'll just do the tongue thing. So you guys heading forward? Yeah, I think so. So as you guys head forward, you eventually get up next to that entrance into the room. The curtain has been torn down, so you can kind of see in it. There's like a table with like a weird statue on it, a few crates and stuff. And you can see three heads around the inside that next room, kind of peeking around the wall to whatever room lies behind it. And as soon as you look in, they like shift and scramble back, back behind that other wall um, as you guys pass by. I think as we are passing by, I smile at them. They are like simultaneously jump before scattering back into the other room. Um, unless you'll stop to do anything else, you guys will eventually pass by that room. Um, yeah. I think just as I'm uh, passing, I'm going to stop, poke my head in, see if they look at me, and then yep. turn into a cute little puppy and just bounce off. <laughs> <laughs> Their jaws all just drop. The big one who is petting and holding a large rat, like clutching it, just kind of drops the rat onto the ground, which lands and then scampers off. Did she hop away like a little puppy? You guys passing by that room, um, you guys enter into another room that's familiar. You see the running water in the center of the room, the bridge over to the other side. You can see the blood spell out splatters and a few of the Remaining corpses, though, it looks like they've been mostly chewed through um, of where you guys fall. The rats, the rats in the swarm of rats. You were to cross back over that bridge, enter into the uh, rest of the viaduct. And at this point, you're back into the section of the viaduct that was actually mapped out that y'all were handed the map to. Um, so you're no longer having to follow your yellow paint and you're able to pretty easily follow your way out. Let me do some weird, weird, timey, wimey shit. To figure out what time of day it is. Uh, so you guys come out. And this is mostly a guess, but an educated one. You guys come out and uh, the sun is still out. Though it does look like it's fading. But the sun will be setting in a few hours. As you exit the viaduct. Entering into those massive stairs that were obviously built for creatures that were maybe 20 foot tall. Leading back up toward Nymanet in the city. As soon as we are outside... I just stand still and close my eyes and breathe in that fresh air. It's that fresh, cold air that almost stings going in, but it feels so good since you've been used to that dank, heavy, moldy air for almost two days. I'm so fucking tired of being underground. I'll just nip at her heels and start dragging them forward. Yes, one of you probably had to carry me through that as a puppy. <laughs> so um, where are you guys heading? Temple of Severa first, and then I'll go to the Temple of Aiyin and figure out what we're doing with this yeah. meeting. And um, then possibly finding a place to stay for the first time in like three days. Yeah. Yeah, and I would like to take a little visit to the Temple of Altamari as well, though that could be tonight or it could be in the morning, depending on how much time we take on other things. I need to speak. So returning to myself, after returning the object, we could split up to our respective temples. I don't really plan on telling anybody there, but I think I might need to talk to the Vivis Tree again before we go. That is actually something I was going to suggest. We've learned a lot more now than the first time you spoke to it. Him? It? I don't even know. In any case, that seems like a good idea. Uh, I can look for securing rooms for us for the night. Do we need them? We've fairly rested. I mean, and I, I don't know what time they keep on the other side. I am not very well rested from that trip up the elevator. I could use some sleep. Ah, I see. Might not need sleep, but I'm still hurting a bit from that last fight, so... Well, um, 
let's go return this schematic and get about our business in town. Okay, so you guys are first sticking together, going to the scriptorium to turn in the quest, essentially, and then splitting. Sounds like. Okay. So you guys are having this discussion as you're passing through the pale row, sort of the squatter city just outside of the walls, where it's a lot of broken down old buildings, some newly constructed and burned down again. Some of it, the old white stone from when the city was first formed. You pass through it, through the thick outer walls and ramparts guarded by the vanguards of Wolfrath, um, entering into the city proper. You guys head up towards the hill where the um, and tower where the scriptorium lies. Making your way there, you approach the gate, where is an individual where you've met before when you've paid entrance. Who kind of recognizes you as you walk up? Yes, um, entrance to the scriptorium today for an hour for the day. Go get your boss. We have something for him. Ah, um, uh, which boss would that be? We need to speak to uh, Sage Alana, I believe is her name. Uh, first, Sage Alana, actually. I can contact her. Who should I say is contacting her? The bronze scales. We have an item that she wants. An item that she wants. Okay. Well, um, just a moment. The man nods towards the other woman who's kind of at the desk. She kind of slides to the center to deal with anyone else who come as he leaves. A few minutes later, he returns. Um, I've been informed that she will be down here shortly, um, and for you to wait in the principal portion, uh, which is this way. And he kind of guides you through the gates, unlocks the gates uh, with an arcane. It's not a key. It's an arcane something using uh, the holy symbol as he moves through the gate, guiding you in, locking the door behind, leading you into sort of a foyer. Um, there are a few desks here and bookshelves kind of all lining the rows as it leads into the rest of the inner chambers. Um, again, the inside of the scriptorium tower being much bigger on the inside than it is on the outside. About 15 minutes pass as you're kind of waiting around and eventually the verse sage returns in her kind of grayish sage green robe. Um, she approaches. But, hello. Um, let's enter into this private chambers, please. And she kind of guides you through one of the holes and then into a private office where she closes the door behind you. Well, um, I've been told that you have recovered what you are looking for. Yes, we have. May I see it? Um, and I will reach into the satchel of holding and pull out the schematic first. Okay, you pull it out, placing it upon the desk, and this this Two foot by one foot large slab of stone carved with tons of glyphs and runes all overlapping over one another. She kind of traces along it, pulls out a piece of um, a journal and kind of looks through it, comparing notes. That is, this appears to be the Akhenaten schematic. It seems to be intact. We also have two bodies, though I'm not sure if you want them here or somewhere else. Hmm. Here would be here for it work, actually. Are they bloodied? Uh They're dead, so a little bit. A little bit. Uh, Alright, well um Do you need to get a tarp or something? She raises her hand and whispers words. It will be here shortly. Great, someone hold the bag open. Uh, I will slip. Yeah. As you open up the bag, a few minutes later, a younger sage comes in um, with a sheet of cloth, lays it out onto the ground um, as Ellery opens up the bag and Ezekiel begins to tug. Yeah, I'm just like two hands in, pull whatever appears in my hands. So I don't know. And try and bend and twist the body into the right position so that it will come out. The first one's not bad. Um, she's 
a little more slender than than he was, a little less armored. So she comes out, crown first, like breathing a job, uh, pretty easily, flopping onto the ground. The smell is beginning to hit, as she's been dead for a few days. Um, the next one's a little harder as the boot comes into your hand first, and there's some wrangling you have to do with the other leg to get it into your other hand. Eventually, you're able to pull this thing out, dropping it onto the cloth. The young sage who's there is just like mouth open, like watching two bodies being pulled out of a bag. Yeah. Um, and just to be clear that the, this, uh, the second body in particular is without the items that we found on him. Sure. Um, I'm going to take out that perfume I got and just spray it into the satchel folding before we close it. Okay. Yeah, there's probably a little bit of something in that bag. She looks over and kind of um, looks over the bodies, trying to verify their identity as best she can. And did you find any sort of identifying mark on this one? She points to the man. The issue was uh, had a mask on when he first came. Just to verify his uh, identity. Sorry, I, I didn't quite catch. He, she was pointing at the assassin. V- uh, yes, I, I recognize the face of the female. However, the man, we did not see his face as he came in. Was he wearing any marks that could verify his identity? Any question? Did Ezekiel yeah. put the uh, locket. locket back or did he hold on to that? Uh, he gave it back. Okay. What was on him? The locket, the sword, and the cloak? And the cloak. Well, I don't want to give them any of those. I, uh, yeah. Yeah, and we, we don't have to. That wasn't part of the deal. Uh, yeah, he, this cloak. I'll pull that kind of... I guess Melly's probably wearing it, so I'll just kind of point at it. Yeah, you turn her around, and she kind of looks at it. Um, interesting. And there's about... 10 minutes when she just ignores any comments and she writes down notes about the cloak, looking over it. Uh, that's, that should suffice for now. And this is obviously not of any uh, standard arcane make and uh, has some of the symbology that we have been researching since the first incursion. Well, you have earned your reward, which was a certain amount of gold. She again raises her hand, whispers something, and a few minutes later, a sage arrives. This time flanked by two tone bearers in the gray robes, clearly the sort of arcanist or mage bodyguards of the scriptorium who appear flanking the other sage who's holding a small box, a small wooden box. Um, they place on the desk, she opens it up, and there are 500 platinum. And in addition to this, um, I believe it was 500 for the bodies. And she pulls out from her satchel on her side the coin for that as well, placing it into the box, which is about the size of a shoebox, a little smaller than that. Yes, I believe that is what we agreed. So we will ensure that the schematic is returned into a safer um, holding vault. And more high security. The also, she nods as the tone bearers and both sh- sages leave, leaving just you and her in the room. The also, um, inquiring into the possibility of some sort of uh, betrayal within our ranks. The schematic was already in a, a relatively high security vault. Entrance is um, difficult unless you know where to look. We will be looking into this. I believe your contract is finished and you have been adequately rewarded. As I mentioned earlier, if there is any information you could lend, we would be very grateful for what you saw down there. Well, we saw a lot of tunnels. Right. There was a kelp aberration thing down there. Who took care of it? Okay, sure. Some rats that look diseased. All right. Well, if you think of anything um, more pertinent to our investigation or anything that we should know, please um, reach out to me, as you did prior. Um, And I will give you this as well. And she pulls out a folded parchment 
that's inside of a small leather. It looks like a passport, basically, but inside is a symbol of Severa. Uh, this will not grant you to any of the um, more reserved portions, but it will grant you to the principal portion and will also help with any uh, quicker uh, access to me or any of the other verse sages, should you need me. Let's uh, show this to the front desk if uh, you have any questions. Well, thank you. Of course. And if and we... you for the return. Yes. If we think of anything that you should know, we'll make sure to come by and tell you about it. I would appreciate that, yes. Well, I have to get it to the vaults. I thank you for your service. And um, have a good night. She gives a light whistle as the tone bearer is going to enter once again as she places the schematic into her, apparently a satchel of holding, by her side. The sage was waiting out door, or out of the door, and uh, I will um, escort you um, back to the general portion, if that's okay. As the right. Versailles Yolana and the Tone Bearers exit down the hall one way, you guys are led the other way and eventually out towards the entrance gate outside of the tower. The sun is now setting. It'll probably be below the horizon within maybe 20, 30 minutes. Well, should we proceed to our respective temples and go about our business? Yeah. yeah. Uh, question. Do we want to split up this reward, or should we keep it together in case there's something that we all need? Or split some and keep some in reserve? I mean, if I take a hundred gold, you can have the rest of mine. I mostly just use it when I don't know what to say. Uh, if I need something, I'll let you know. All right. Any other thoughts, preferences? I think it'd be a good idea for us to save up our party funds. We've all got access to it whenever we need it, so. Do any of you need anything now that you can think of? Shouldn't. I have a thought for something that we could use at least some of this for once we get back home. But uh, we also need to think about if we have any immediate needs. Let me know if any of you need anything. And I will uh, pass a hundred gold to Ezekiel. Thank you kindly. Uh, we should just make sure we have enough rations to get us through. We don't know when we will be back. Yeah, we could definitely get some rations. I could just pay for some out of what we have, and we could keep it all together, unless you want to carry it all separately. But I think it would be good to lug it around in something a little bit easier to carry. I mean, if you have your fancy magic bag, and you want to just keep track of what's in there, then... I don't have a problem with that. Just we'll keep an eye on that bag. Mm -hmm. Oh, and Vesper, you wanted to hold on to the second fancy magic bag? I would love that. I'm starting to get bogged down with quite a few things. Um, so it'd be a good place to keep my tools and medic kits and things. So I'll pass that over to her. Thank you much. What happens if you put one magic bag into the other magic bag? Mm, nothing good, try? I think. Let's maybe not try it. And we split up. Yep. Okay, so Ezekiel's going to the Vivis Tree, Ellery is going to the Storm Temple, Vesper is going to the Aiein Temple, Ball, Amson. Here you go. Uh, I'm going to go to the, uh, what was it called? The public house at World's End, I think, sure. is where that inn was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'll I'll get some lodging for us for the night there, where we can rest up and whatever. Okay. And Ball. I'll go with Vesper to the Temple Bay. Okay. So Ampson, you're able to get there and acquire rooms. They are. Two silver each for rooms, so however many you want to have a few. 
as you're doing that, Ezekiel, um, you leave the city, pass through the Pale Row, entering into the old growth, walking through the woods, uh, snow covering the ground as it's starting to enter into uh, winter. But as you enter in that old growth, while there still may be some snow on the ground and upon the stones and rocks, there is a warm breeze that permeates this growth, allowing the vegetation to thrive. Um, eventually, you make it towards where the vivis tree was, entering into that clearing where you see a number of animals, birds, wolves, bears, and a number of other humanoids, or druids in their human forms as well, kind of resting upon branches and stumps and rocks around the tree. A few kind of stand up as you enter, but recognizing you, they kind of take a few steps back, sitting back down. Ezekiel will just approach the tree. Um, I do not have that spell prepared today, so I will not be able to speak to it in the same way. I think he will uh, take off his armor and his cloak and just kind of be down to linens, uh, and he will kneel in prayer. Okay. Kneeling down, bowing your head. How do you pray? What do you pray about? Uh, I think I just, Ezekiel will kind of dig his fingers into the soil around the tree and just silently be asking, Zina, I've learned a lot about divine gates and failed worlds, and I'm trying my best to do the thing that you sent me to here to do. I think I'm supposed to be protecting these gates. But am I? Amson said when he talked about what happened that not all the gods wanted this gate in place. I assume because you are the cornerstone of it that you wanted it, but did you? Do you? I could use some guidance on if I'm following the right path. As you pray, digging your hands into the soil, speaking or thinking this message, the warm wind kind of rides and circles around the tree, the boughs and leaves shaking and dancing in it. You can almost hear whispers coming through the clattering of the leaves in the wind and the branches and twigs moving, roots churning beneath your feet, but whispered as if through the winds of a storm. You can't quite make it out what the words are. You feel a warmth on your shoulder, a hand. As you look over and you see your guardian, she nods at you and closes her eyes as a warmth travels down her arm to you, clarifying the words for you. Speaking in the language of the vivistry of plants, you now begin to make out the words of what's left of a sigma. As with before, the branches, even though they don't shift to form this, is almost as if your eyes clarify, adjust, and you can now see a face in the leaves flowing in the wind. Gate. Yes, I remember this. But you ask of paths. My memory stretches back to my creation. I am but a seed. A shadow beneath the boughs of a Sintma. I am what's left of that nature. A manifestation of what he was. I don't remember before, aside from what I can read upon the scars on my branches. You speak of paths. I know not the fortunes that lie ahead. 
This is another realm. And though the past over Sintma, time roots stretching into eternity, the future is not our realm. Others speak to us, Ezekiel, to me, to the winds and rivers and trees and beasts of nature. They call out, they ask questions of paths. We know not. There is one that may know, one left behind, one who can see the future as they were there when it was created. I can give you their name, but you must seek them. I know not their intentions or what they see, but you may ask them of paths. Mm, the masked one, their true name, Damadedius. A servant of God's long past, a celestial from the previous annuus, from before time. They speak of paths to me, they whisper it on the wind. But there is more, Ezekiel. The face shifts. Almost as if uh, static on a screen, the face kind of flickers in and out for a moment. When you see God's rust surrounded by armies, then know that its desolation has come near. Then let those who are upon the pinnacle flee to the mountains. And let those who are inside the city depart. And let not those who are out in the forest into it, for these are the days of vengeance, to fulfill all that is written. The face flickers once again. <sighs> oh well, Ezekiel. And the face shifts back into that of just a tree. Looking over your shoulder, the guardian gone, no one else apparently able to see her as he shifts away in the wind. Ezekiel's just going to sigh and shake a little bit, write down the second part of that prophecy, apparently, as well as Damadius? Dadius? I'll get that later. Um, uh, I think he's actually, if they will let him uh he's just going to uh sleep in the grove as close to the vivis tree as possible i think he's seeing god's rest surrounded by armies and being told to leave where this tree is is not making him comfortable as you settle in for the night no one stops you as ezekiel settles in um, Ellery, you approach the temple of the storm. Okay. Again, the rain, lightning, crackling as you approach it. I have a couple of things I might want to do here, depending on who I can find around. But first things first, I'm going to go up to the platform and do what I think I've probably done fairly regularly during the time that I've been here and sit down on the platform to sort of think, pray, meditate. As I look into this storm, I hold on to the locket and I say, Fall to Mary. There's a lot of bullshit going on right now. And I don't know if you have any answers for me. Maybe this is something that 
I and my friends have to figure out, but I could use some guidance. I don't know if I can comprehend the scale of what we could be getting ourselves into, but I want to know what your will is. And I know that I need to be stronger if I'm going to pit my will against some of the people that we may end up having to face. So please, please grant me some of your strength so that I can find the path that I need to take so I can chart a course through the storm that I think is coming. The swirling storm beneath you continues in fury and anger crackling with lightning and thunder, roaring as the rain continuously pelts you. The electricity stretches off, slamming into the nearby walls and ceiling above. Give me a wisdom check. All right. Uh, That would be a four. Okay. The lightning... Slams against the walls, striking as the storm continues to rage below. And as you've sat here before, over that past year of training, you've gotten to where you can almost look into it, kind of see through it, that this is just a path. This is not Voltamary itself. And that the true strength of Voltamary lies beyond it, beyond the storm wall. As you open your eyes and and see this, a small spark of lightning strikes out at you, slamming into your hand, uh, surging up towards your elbow and arm, leaving a mark upon your hand. It burns and singes as you pull it back and deals eight lightning damage. Ah. Uh, How much lightning damage is that? Eight. Okay. And I'm almost down to half again. Um, so I guess I look down at my hand and kind of shake it out a bit. And I'm going to stand up and go see who I can find below. Okay. Coming below, you see there's a few wanderers, followers of Voltamary. You recognize one, uh, Braun. Voyager Braun Ator, the wind genasi, the tall, muscular, light blue skin. Uh, long blue-black hair pulled into a braid and with a curving long black-blue goatee. And he's wearing that sort of heavy armor, but it's made of like galvanized stone. And you got to recognize him and he you as he nods towards you. Hello, you. Hey. Is, uh, Saris around today? Not here, but near the storm. Right. Can I ask you something? Sure. Do you know much about the Voltars? Mm, little. Mm. Why? Well, I've been kind of curious. I know that they... That they kind of guard travel between the planes. But I'm wondering if they are just guarding specific points... Or if it's all travel between the planes in general? All of it. And it's not just guarding. They facilitate the travel. Interesting. The storm goes well it wills, and through the storm you can step through the walls and divides of the planes. And they generally hang out on the Astral Sea, right? They sail it. Yes, winds. Hmm. Have you ever heard of any other celestials, angels, on the Astral Sea besides them? I'm sure there are many. They buffer the storm around Celestia. There are many servants of deities there. You wouldn't happen to have ever heard of any specific ones, have you? Names? Well, I don't have a name. But there's one that uh, I found some notes on. 
who wears this gold armor with runes that say, or they translate as Servant of Sky and Sacred Star. Um, I know not. I've heard of the servants of Ayain, Valasol, and Vakashon, but not what you describe. I am not a scholar, neither we. Yeah, neither am I. Oh, thanks anyway. Um, if you see Saras or Gath, would you mind asking them if they've heard of anything like that before? I can do this, yes. I appreciate it. Maybe you'll have to go to the sea and ask them yourself. Yeah. You've all to us. <laughs> that would be interesting. He kind of looks at your <laughs> hand, Bart. Keep, keep chasing it. I will. I will. Good. And nods, grasp your forearm, shakes it. Storm guide you. And you. He nods as he turns to leave the temple. Uh, and I am going to head back and uh, see if I can find Amson. Sure. Okay. So you head back towards the pub, Vesper, and Paul. And the sun is now at this point set as you head towards the Redemption Zenith, toward the district of 4 Aiyin. Passing by the hospital where you trained with the surgeons, um, past the orphanage and up into the temple itself, the fane of absolution. You see the griffins flying, landing upon the towers that surround it. This smaller district upon a hill. Uh, can I find um, redeemed Olivia? Okay, yeah. Um, you enter into the temple. There's a few vindicators. She's not in her normal seat by the altar. Um, asking them, one of them recognizes you and nods, leaving. About 30-ish minutes later, 20 to 30 minutes later, um, Olivia kind of approaches. She's not in her armor. She's wearing kind of a robe cloak. Vespa, yes. Hi. Uh, can we go somewhere private to talk? Of course, yes. Um, this way. And she kind of guides you through a side room away from the altar and the cleansing waters into kind of a side room. Um, what, what is it? Is everything all right? Mm, that's a really good question. Um, we were... Um, whew, I'm not really sure where to begin with all of this. Uh, I guess... Do you know... Man, this is a lot. Um, I'm trying to figure out how to forgive and redeem someone without given, without joining the, their side of a conflict that I don't want to be on. Well, this is difficult. It's the path we walk. Dimension is a choice. We and Aiyin can guide those on that path, but they must make that choice. We must take care to attempt redemption, but not corrupt ourselves in the process. To attempt to guide the others, but understand that sometimes there is no easy choice. That the other side doesn't choose redemption leaving us with no other option but to fight. This is what the Vindicators, the Griffin Riders, were. Do you know what Aiyan's involvement was in creating the Divine Gate? I know some. The gate itself was to protect the children of deities and to protect the gods. A Saint Mark gave up the most to anchor the gate, divined by Sir, divined and designed by Severa. 
each of the prime gods gave up something to create the seals. Akashon, Valaso, Eain, some gods, Gotharon, Sita, Zihara, did not give up any. They worked against the gate, Duma as well. A bit of divinity was placed into the divine anchors on the other side. Each of those prime gods gave up a little, including Eain. It was said she gave up a feather. Not sure if it's just symbolic or actual, but some portion of her divinity in order to secure the gate. You don't think she'd... You don't think she could understand if the world might be better without it? Better without the gate? It was once like that, but that did not separate the gods. Cotteron and see there, others would not cease their incursions upon the plains, leaving the gods and the servants of gods to fight. And when gods fight, there's collateral damage. There's no avoiding it, try as you might. The children gave up something too, but it was they who, us, who betrayed the gods. And to preserve us, they had to leave us. Though they are still here, it's more distant than before, but that keeps the other deities at bay. And keeps some betraying children from attempting to do what they did before. What if there are those that are descended from those betrayers that aren't corrupt and are still being punished? I... The world... Where is this coming from, Vesper? I kind of look at Val. We found something under the viaduct. Someone. I guess I will kind of explain to her what happened, um, both a little bit in White Guard and then what happened here. I see. Um, this is not an easy thing, but something that was chosen by gods, decided by gods beyond us. There is not a good answer, sometimes. And sometimes choices must be made. It just feels... I mean, I'm a loyal servant of Aiyin, ultimately, at the end of, of any day. You're redeemed, but, Vespa. More than that. But we're taught to forgive and to help redeem. And what of those who do not accept it? But they might. Then that is your task. We're going to speak with them in the Shadow Fell, Sh uh, Felnor. And I just wanted someone on this side to know in case something went horribly wrong. Thank you for bringing this to me. And take care not to let them corrupt you, lead you astray. They may have their logic and reasons, but our calling is beyond that. It is beyond our own logic and reasons. It is the judgment of gods, of Ai. Don't forget your task, Vesper. I won't. I must get some rest, but rest assured I will keep these words in mind. Good luck, Vesper. I'll take my leave, unless Ball has anything to add. I'm going to say that maybe Ball sees that you're kind of having, you have a bit of a closer connection with, with her, so Ball kind of lets you two have your space and does that thing where he's there, but he's not really there. So when you look at Ball, Ball's looking off to the side anyway and not really listening in. So maybe you come up to Ball and you say, you know, that you're done. All right. Well, she knows what we're planning. So we've got someone on this side looking out for us if something must go wrong. Yeah. The situation is make me do a lot of thinking. Yeah. Any conclusions you want to share? Still thinking. We can't forget ourselves. We're not like what they're doing is wrong, but I know why they're doing it. Maybe we can 
find a way to convince at least Braun. He maybe seemed understanding, or like he might be. He didn't want to follow the Will's path of destruction. Maybe we can find some point in him that can be redeemed. What he believes he's doing well. He is doing doing good by what he believes in. How can someone be redeemed if they are not doing anything wrong? That's true. We can try. Do you think he's doing right, Paul? I believe, like us, he's trying to do right. Do we know what's right? Does he know what's right? Let's go find the others. Paul kind of does like a little uh, sign of AIE at the altar and kind of turns around and gets ready to head out. As we head out, though, Klaus, how far is the Temple of Akashan from here? Um, it's uh, pretty far. Is it in like the opposite direction of where we want to go? It is. Okay. I'll just go back to the inn. Okay. And do that um, in the morning. You eventually all find your way back to the inn where Amson has secured rooms. Um, and unless there's something else, we will begin the second half of the episode with you guys waking up in the morning. Next time, on Back to the Story. As all of the runes ignite and glow, a complex pattern of glowing lines connect each other and form a mesh beneath your feet. There are four blocks of skeletons, 200 each, 800 in total surrounding this singular structure. The visitor, the last faction to fold in line, your enemy, should you choose it. For part two of this episode of Back to the Story, you can find it on Stitcher, Google Play, Player FM, or TuneIn. We also have a YouTube channel called Back to the Story, an actual play podcast. If you'd like to support the show, feel free to buy us a coffee at ko-fi.com slash back to the story.